Thanks for watching our broadcast. We're so glad that we have the opportunity to come into your home, your iPhone, your tablet, your Android, whatever means you are watching us. We need your help. It is made possible by generosity of others like yourself that allows us to come into your space. So please do us a favor. Text to give something towards this broadcast. It makes a difference so that we can continue to bring this ministry to you. Let's get into the broadcast. I want to read Songs of Solomon, chapter number eight. And I want to read it from the Message Bible. <laughs> I want to give you a little flip side to this. You do know scripture on relationships is written by two people. One who was not married, Paul, and one who had multiple women named Solomon. Just let that marinate and let it sizzle in your spirit. Look at that. There, there's no book of scripture that's written by a couple. And there's no book of the Bible written by a female to give their perspective. So traditionally they say 50% of marriages end in divorce, 60% and a divorce in the local church context, 20% are really healthy and successful. And I, I, I believe part of it is various reasons, but I believe part of it is that we are oftentimes challenged on finding material that translates to culture, not saying scripture doesn't translate, but there are parts of scripture that culturally don't fit, like a woman needs to be silent in church, and the reason why was because in that day, women were not taught, they were not learned, and so that fit that, that, that stanza in today's culture, that's not necessarily the case. There are women that are more educated than men. There are some women that are making more than men. And so we have a different context. And so this morning, we want to talk from an interesting book that we read called His Needs, Her Needs. I encourage all of you all to read it. and It'll be helpful for you. Songs of Solomon 8, 6, and 7 says, Hang my locket around your neck. Wear my ring on your finger. And um, love is invincible, facing danger and death. Passion laughs at the terrors of hell. The fire of love stops at nothing. It sweeps everything before it. Flood waters can't drown love. Torrents of rain can't put it out. Love can't be bought. Love can't be sold. Love can't be bought. Love can't be sold. Okay. Well, after just reading that, I first of all, we have to come to realize when we look at a marriage between a man and a woman, you really have to link it and connect it with Christ and the church. Right? So Christ is perfect. We're not perfect. But the church isn't perfect either. And through his love you know, to the church and to us as in individuals help us to grow and see things within ourselves. So in a marriage, first of all, it's very important to pray. You have to understand before him, before your spouse, before your children, it has to be with you and God. And then he can really open you up to see other things that you need to see. So we know there's like, there's 10 emotional needs in a marriage, in, in individuals that we have. And, and we're going to say it from each perspective, because here's the thing. One, we're not relational therapists for sure. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing that we do know is that we see and hear love differently. And what, and so here's what I wrote that I think is so important is that falling in love with who was will not keep you in love with who is. <laughs> Falling in love who, with who was will not keep you in love with who is. We all grow. Who, we, who she was or is five years ago is not who she is today. Who I was five years, thank God, who I was five years ago, <laughs> I was very immature. Who I was five years ago was not who I am today. And so a lot of times we have, the, the thing about the New Testament church is this, is saying this. So here's the thing with the New Testament church. We are experiencing a lot of people who were genuinely in love but fell out of love. 
because it is possible. I don't care how you try to tell me. It is possible to fall out of love if you don't manage it well. Because there are people who got divorced or who are divorced who genuinely loved each other in the onset but never evolved as the person evolved and we all evolve. And I want to talk about Teddy's and I want all of us brothers. Oh, by the way, ladies, there's a breakfast that we want you to text that's happening in the last. Talk about that. February 23rd. Is that a Saturday? Yep. Um, 930. At 930. Won't be long, about an hour and a half. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, we can't just stay for an hour, at least an hour and a half. And we're just going to have a good time, you know, continue our conversation that we started. And we really had a great time before. So please text that number. 407-449-8884 Royalty. Yes. Boom. All right. Short commercial. So, but here's the thing. So there's 10 things. So I'm going to ask husbands, wives, and singles, because we're not excluding you, to start to highlight these 10 and understand what these 10 mean to you because they mean different things in your season of life that what's the most important to you and so she's going to talk about one and I'll talk about one and then we'll go back and forth. Okay the things that I'm going to gravitate towards more is what most women tend to need the most. And it can vary because, you know, we're all different. So I might say something and you might not need that. Amen. Well, he might hit it and you, you'll say, okay, that's more like me. So it's not one size fit all. It's just, just you know, get what you can receive from it. And the first one is um, admiration. So a feeling of wonder, pleasure, or approval, right? So me as a woman, if I'm doing something... I would like to get recognized, right? You know, affirmation. That this, that's my love language, number one, anyway. So I like to get affirmed. So if I'm doing something and it's not being noticed, you know, I can feel some type of way. Yes. You know, and... <laughs> yes. And um, Be, so, go so, ahead. So a admiration is... It, what, was your, what was the word? I guess, admiration. admiration. So admiration, my wife is, uh, she's the tool belt person in the house. She fixes things, builds things, screws things in, all that type of stuff. I don't, I don't do none of that. And I'm, I'm fine with that, praise the Lord, because uh, I give the money to buy those things, and I feel good about that, praise God. But she, she that's, her, that's her thing. And so she redesigned our room, and for me, even though I'm a communicator, I am not an over-communicator. So for me, I'm like, it's good. Now, if I don't like it, I'm going to tell you, like, this all need to go. It, it's not good. But I said it's good. In my it's good, it means this is awesome, this is fabulous, this is great, this is magnificent. But that's not what she needs. And so I walked away feeling good. Man, this is dope. And I'm like, that's it? Like, really, I really put a lot of energy and thought into this process. And with you're just good, that wasn't enough for me. Like, I need to know what you're really thinking about it and how you felt about it. And so, as a male, my thing is, I went to the store with you. We walked around and picked it out together. That's my contribution. So, we have to learn how, okay, so if you need more, if you need more, here's the thing. You can't hold me accountable for what you don't tell me. So if you need more, as opposed to it being an argumentative session, it may just be best to say, this is what I need. And here's the thing. If you're single and admiration is your thing that you need, you've got to be careful that you're not starving from it so much that you just give yourself up to anybody who just meets the need that you're desperate for at that season. Amen. Okay, so another one, number two, affection. He's more needy of the affection than I do. Yes, sir. For some reason, you know, and that's okay. <laughs> so that's why I say not all, you know, one size fit all. <laughs> because in a lot of relationships, the women, they need more affection, right? I want to be coddled and I want, you know, you need to be right next to me. But because... Not that I don't like affection, I do like affection and I want affection. It's just because I'm always moving and going. Like, I'm always doing something. 
So I don't get the time to rest as much that he might get because I work a, you know, at a school system and then I get home and I have like another little school system right there because I have four children. So we have four children. So yes, I love it when he shows that affection, but I realized that I wasn't giving him enough affection. Like I wasn't stopping and then, you know, just rubbing on him and everything Watch that it. he needed. <laughs> so. I turned rated on real quick. So here's the thing. Um, so <laughs> this is, this is, so everybody's raised differently. Everybody's raised differently. And ba like for me, it is a challenge to naturally parent. My wife is naturally a good parent, just naturally. For me, it is work because my parents were not, my dad wasn't as active. He was very, his love language was, I provide a house for you to live in. You're, you always have food in your fridge. And so that, that getting down on the ground, playing and stuff, like, we ain't, we ain't do none of that. And so even though I had a brother and sister, I was technically an only child because my sister was living her own way. My brother left and went to the military. So I grew up an only child. I grew up a very only child. Like, I grew up, even though I have siblings, like, there was, like, uh, what was it? Like, uh, holidays would be the worst. Because it was weird for me to see Thanksgiving. I used to dread it because her family, they all get together. They all text each other high-five each other, and I'm like, we don't do this around where I'm from. We don't, no, I used to just think it was awkward. And it, it, it became a very tough experience for me to go through family reunions because I don't remember my family being at an entire table. So what Thanksgiving, which was a blessing for her, was a nightmare for me. So that's why we got to learn people's background and not try to make them who we want them to be because we're all different. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point where I wrote that. Like, I must learn how to enjoy meeting his emotional need that are low on my list of priorities. So we all have our list of priorities. Just because it's low on our list, it doesn't mean it's, we ignore it and we, it's not important to him, it's vice versa. So... With my family, my father, he was very affectionate. My mom, she, you know. No, she not. Yeah. <laughs> she was more like, you know, go do this and that. But she loved us, and we know that she did, and just the way that she did certain things. But my father would do more activities with us. So I had that growing up. And it was difficult for me to understand, like, what's wrong with you? Why you're always, like, away when I'm trying to include him with the family? It was just what he said. It wasn't like that for him. But it took some time, and now he's like, you know, yeah, 100%. It's, it's still Good. work, though, Good. because I need a break from my kids. Oh, yeah. And, and you can look at me the way you want. I don't care. But that's just, that, that's just the way that I grew up. Like, I get recharged, and I need to almost go into a little cave and recharge myself to go back out and become the father and things that they need. And so that's, that's important. Like, my kids are... Uh, they're not necessarily, they're kids. They, they like to do kid things. They like to wrestle and they like to play and they like to talk and they, <laughs> like, hey guys, let's play a game. Who could be quiet the longest, right? All right. So, but it, you have to learn everybody's um, strength. And so for, for me, my, my upbringing was my brother and sibling, they left at a, at a young age, and my brother was my superhero. He left at a young age. And so I have a switch. to pro So in order to protect myself, I have this cutoff switch. I'm a loyalist. If you go to jail, I'm going to be right there with you because that's just me. I'm, I'm going to ride with you forever. You go to jail, murder somebody, I'm be like, yeah, I'm his pastor. I'm sorry, bro. I'm, I'm going to stand with you. But if I feel like you're disloyal, I can just cut you off like you never existed. Because it's a switch within me to protect myself from the damage of people walking out on you that you love. So when you know these type of switches that your spouse may have, that's why it's important for you to stay connected. And so that you can be that intercessor for your, your spouse. You know, because that's not healthy to have a switch like that. And 
in order for, you know, I won't go after him and attack him because we all have flaws that we need to work in within ourselves. I will pray for him and continue to, you know, cover him in prayer for that need in that area that is hurting him. So the next one, go to the next one. Conversation. Yes. So not just simple surface talk like, that was good, and then walking away. <laughs> like, deeper conversation. I need to know your thoughts, your feelings. You know, what's happening in your life? While I'm at, in the classroom, what's going on in your world? And I need to know that you want to hear what's happening in my world. It's not just me asking you, but it's a feeling that I have inside when I know that what is going through in my everyday life is important for you and is important enough for you to ask about it and really mean it, not just say, how's your day, you know, just to get it over with, but really sit there and listen. You know, here's the thing. You, you definitely probably don't want to, because you could think you're doing well as a spouse, but you can't grade yourself. And so I, if you're going to ask, you better be prepared for the answer. So how do you feel we doing? I think you're a C. What? Like, you know, you got a house to live in. You got food to eat. You know, that's not enough? No, it's not enough. So here's the thing. Conversation is big, but if you are one that does not communicate a lot, um, then you're going to have to work on finding the right spot to communicate. Right? So this is the part that's very important. Who you were a few years ago is not who you are today. So several, when we first started the church, it was like, yo, church is kind of what you do. I'm raising kids, having a job as a teacher. I don't have the opportunity to be as available as you are. Well, 10 years later, I still had that same mindset. She's like, no, I want to be involved. When did this happen? Right? So there are times where you just like, I'm just going to make the decision and, and go for it. And she feels excluded from the process. But in your mind, you're just thinking, I'm just loving you the way that you originally wanted to be loved. So that's why it's important to stop and check and see who are you today? Because what you valued yesterday, you may not value today. Yes. And just a... Uh, uh what happened to us one day was, you know, we just weren't clicking inside the house for some whatever reason. And then I went my normal devotion time in the morning and I went to pray and, and it was talking about this one word that I'll share with you later, um, a little bit more deeper empathy. And I was just reading, I felt convicted. So I was like, okay, I'm going to ask, what is wrong? Because you know, you don't want to say anything. You just want to be like, whatever, I'm mad too, you're mad, whatever, we're just going to be mad. <laughs> And let it be, whatever. You come into me first. But then I, was, I went back into bed and I was like, okay. I saw that he was up and I asked him what was wrong. And then when he was telling me some of the things were my flaws, instead of listening to the Holy Spirit within me, what I should have said, I put a wall up in defense. You know, I went on defense mode and say, well, this is what you're missing and what you're not doing. And it, it did not work out well. And then immediately, you know, I knew I was wrong. So when you're wrong, you have to, in that conversation, admit that you're wrong, you know? So I, that's what I had to do. I had to turn back around. It took me some time, and I text, because he was already gone. <laughs> and sometimes it's okay, you know, but you have to make sure you know how to do your wording correctly so it's not misunderstood. And I just simply said I was wrong, and I'm sorry. I should have never said that, although what I meant was true. But the way I went about saying it at the time was wrong. And here's the thing. Like, if you're a communicator, like, you have to look inside of yourself. Because I can make you think you're wrong even though you're right. That used to work in the beginning, right. but it does not work right. anymore. <laughs> I have her thinking, like, I did talk. You're right. I did do that to you. And I'm like, God, I'm good. I just talked my way right out of there. Like, so you, like... All us who are salesmen, who are negotiators, like you have to know that switch doesn't turn off. So it doesn't become an argument about right or wrong. It just becomes an argument about you proving 
to the other side, that you sway them to your perspective. And so one of the books that we're reading on his needs, her needs, is like, when I read it, I was like, dang, that's, that actually is me. It's like, yo, you're selfish. And when you start tracing it back, you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm, it's kind of true. I am kind of selfish. But then you look at your upbringing. My mom, till this day, my mom cooked food for the entire house and made me my own separate food. So, so spoiled is, is kind of the thing. So for me, I grew up where it's like, I ain't eating that. And she'll tell you, like, if I, like, no, I ain't eating that. I'm going to go out and get some food. Because that's how I grew up. You can't undo, sometimes the hardest thing is to unlearn what you learn. We don't raise our kids that way, but oh, that's. No. You're not eating that, you're just not eating. And that's it in my house. <laughs> but, um, I mean, he came a long way with that. So, conversation is real. And... <laughs> right? <laughs> you want to eat? Chipotle, McDonald's, you know, all those stores you can go to. That means you're not hungry. But anyhow, so, <laughs> conversation is very necessary in good times and in bad times. You have to have the right conversation. And it's not always the, what you say is the way you said it. Okay, so you have to really check your tone and check your heart when you're talking to your spouse about something. Now, domestic support is a big one for me because I did most of the housework. I do all of the cooking. I did most of the cleaning, most of the child raising, everything, especially in the beginning. So it came to a point like, okay, I would express my feelings about that. And then he would be like, okay. So he would wash a couple dishes here and there. He would... I mop the floors and he, clean he the bathrooms. He would mop the floor, and then he would leave certain Stand things, and, you know, I like 100%, and he wasn't given 100% of effort. But that's what he gave. And in his eyes, he's like, I'm helping. But it was my job to tell you, no, oh, I gl I'm happy that you're helping, but I need more than that. And it's okay to need more. And it's, you don't want to diminish him and crush him for what he's doing. You know, you, you're happy about it. You praise him for it. But if you're really struggling, you need more help, it's okay to say that you need more help. And that was the best thing I ever done. My goodness, I went home one day and I saw some clothes folded. I almost died. I said, what? That was the first I almost time died too, doing in 15 it years, okay? So he was listening. That showed me that he was listening. That showed me that he cared enough to do that, and he's been listening. I'm like, wow, that was amazing. And I had to show him that, you know, I really appreciate that in different ways. So now the next one is... Um, Family domestic. commitment. Oh, domestic support is helping through that. Mm -hmm. Family commitment. Uh, so <laughs> this is a different one. Uh, she's big family, remember, big family, big things, all that type of stuff. So for me, vacation is... I'm willing to pay a sitter, a family member, to go on vacation with me so that when I am tired of dealing with the kids, I can mm. pawn them off. I know that sounds bad, but that's my reality. Mm. So I need a break. So if we go on a six day, five night, I'm like, okay, I need, a, I need to pay one of my kin folks a ticket. Be, and they get free vacations and they probably love me. But mm. I, I, because my tolerance of talking after a while is, is just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's not all of them. It's just a few of them. It's just, then they gang up together and then they all start acting like each other. It's just, but family commitment is important because on my calendar, I, I have, so if you want to marry someone that is an executive, you're going to have to be willing to give and take. There are times where I travel because that's what my work requires me to do. Uh, so there's, there's times that I'm not there all the time. But as a business owner, an entrepreneur, as many of us are, and, is that you have to highlight the days ahead of schedule that are important to you so that you can be present for the times that you need. So there are certain dates that I already have blocked off. I'm not doing those things on those dates. And also, you have to train people who want to feel like you are accessible to them at any time 
that you're not accessible to, to you at any time. So we can move on. Yeah. All right, family support. Not financial. family support, financial support. So that's very important for most probably women. We need to know the financial aspect of it as a sense as security. You know, are you going to help take care of me and the family as in general? And you can expound on that. And, and she's not, when she say take care of me, I don't want you to think, you see Lady Karen was no, right. He not said, the take care of me, here. praise no. God. <laughs> My wife is not a shopper, I'm the shopper. So I go out and buy her clothes and I style them and I all put them together because that's just me. I, I like, shoot, I, man, I make a dent in buying stuff. Like she's not into nothing brand and all that. It's me that I go to the store and be like, hey, let me pick, what size shoe you wear? I, I'll buy them. But here's the thing. My wife has also been with me when I made bad financial decisions. She had good credit when she met me. And there was a season, yeah, we both had good credit. I had a seven, hers was always higher, I was always in the sevens. But I made a few real estate investments that it, at the time turned sour and caused us to have a foreclosure. And so she never once was like, you ruined my credit, Negro, you know what I'm saying? None, none of that hood stuff. But here's the thing, she, she believed in my dreams enough to allow me to make mistakes so that when harvest season came, you can remember those that stood with you when you made poor financial decisions. So the, the piece about it that's important is that um, I, I do not want to gamble the security of my family away. Okay, so there are investments that people will come and say, hey, you should invest in. I gotta remember that I have four kids as well. We have four children. So if I make a bad decision for the longevity of our lives, we're, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And so here's the other thing. Everybody has their world set up differently. We have our own account together. She has her own account. I have my own account. I have my own business accounts. I mean, she has access to them, but we set it up the way that we want. I'm not t there's no right or wrong way to set up your house. You understand what I'm saying? And so you need to figure out what works for you, but you definitely need to understand that if you're single, you should have some money. If you don't have any kids, there's no reason why you shouldn't have any money, unless you're a college kid. That's an exception to that. But if you're, if you're single and you're working and you don't have any money, don't expect uh, Boaz to come in and rescue you from your financial calamity, okay? And if you are... If you are married and you are having financial issues, it may be best to employ a financial advisor to come in and help you navigate out of the season that you're in. Because, you, you know, we, we started off with our first home had no furniture in there. It had church chairs in the family room for a long time. And my, you know, parents would come over and say, well, when are you going to move this out? When we get the money? Like, we were not in a rush to keep up with people that we didn't feel like we were trying to impress. And now I'm going to tell you that's easier said than done because when you have kinfolk that are doing things faster than you or further than you, you feel a sense that I'm behind and I need to kind of keep up. And so it, it, needs to be very, it needs to be very clear. Like we both have our own account. So whatever she wants to do for her mama, that's on her. She has her own money. But don't, don't take our light money and pay their light bill, and our lights are off. And so there needs to be a balance. Our parents are older, and so we feel a certain responsibility to, to seed back into them. But we're not going to take from our house to seed back into, because that causes a lot of conflict. You're, you're so busy trying to rescue your mother or your father from their situations or your sister or your brother that your whole family is struggling. And, and so that's a very important piece. Okay, so next one, number seven, honesty and openness. So you pretty much have to have trust, you know, in any relationship. And if any time I felt like that trust is broken, that's hard to repair. Over time, it can be repaired, but then I always have that, like, okay, are you telling me the truth? And that should never be a concern in a marriage. I think that, I think it's also important, too, that you understand there are some people in life that are very closed in, 
And if you can't get them to communicate, you may need to find mediators that can. And we live in a world where it's like, I just want to keep my business to myself. You're not going to win. Nobody does. And most marriages that end in divorce could have been fixed had they got somebody in there earlier. And most single issues could have been fixed if you got someone in there earlier. We as a culture, culturally speaking, are very prideful people and private people. And if you're prideful and private, you oftentimes don't let anybody in. So it's important that you find a couple that you can respect. It doesn't have to be your pastor. It could be friends, family, or maybe not family, but um, depends on your relationship that you can find that you can find safety with them. Because a lot of times we, we really don't have no safe places to lay our head. And you need a safe place that you can go to, that you can articulate where you feel, what, you, what your sentiments are, because if you don't, you're going to die alone, even though you have someone with you. And another aspect of being safe, I need to know if I share something with him that is safe. And if he shares something with me that it's safe, that I'm not going to hear it somewhere else or my mama that yes or I'm not gonna embarrass him use it against him you know tell my mama nothing she just be like God I heard I'm not trying to gossip (sighs) like you know how you wait to tell people you're pregnant like mom don't tell nobody she's pregnant you know don't even tell her let her tell you when she's ready you look like you pregnant (laughs) why would you say so and Next one smart. is. I never told her when I was. <laughs> right. I told her when I was ready to tell. Her. Right. My my brother told my mom he was going to propose to his wife, <laughs> and I'm like, why would why would you tell her that? <laughs> she meets the my sister in law now. He's like, you know, tonight you should dress up really well, because <laughs> there's something important going to happen tonight. <laughs> okay, physical attractiveness. It's important for me to know that men are, well, my husband, men in general, my husband is sight stimulated. Right. So All I men. need to look good for him. So when I used to be a stay-at-home mom, you know, sometimes, you know, you're working all day, so you still have your head tied. You still have, you know, some sweats on. You've been cleaning. You've been taking care of the children. And he comes home from work. And you're like, hey, honey. And he's like, oh, hey. And it took a while for me to realize, you know what? I need to always look my best for him. Because I don't know what's out there, what's he seeing out there. And even though I have a totally, you know, a world out in here that's maybe sometimes chaotic, I have to take my time to make sure my hair is done, that, you know, I'm dressed up or, you know, I dress up for him in special ways and different occasions. And, and I, I'm the hair buyer, so that's why I have all yes. the funny hair stories. I, I, I know send what him one to the B hair is, I know what one black is, I know what four B is, I know 30 T. I know all that stuff. So don't come at me in that type of tone when I be at a store. So, you know, so I know I, I am the hair buyer. I go to the store, she, this is the hairstyle I want, I go to the store, this is what I want, and I, whatever. Uh, but, but here's the thing. I like, love it. Here's the thing. The, the crazy thing is this. You've got to know that there is a world out there that prides themselves on being sexual. And if you're single, it's, it's even more complex because people used to, there used to be a time where people wouldn't wear certain things outside the home. Well, that, that doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. So when we're talking about physical attractiveness, it from a single perspective, I am unapologetic that you should date what you like, but you should not limit it to that. Amen. Because just because they are your type doesn't mean they'll make a good husband or spouse or wife or whatever the case is. But these are important for you to know because these, whatever your core values are, that's what you need to date with. Because if you negotiate on these things, you're going to end up being broken by them. And whatever's the most important to you, you shouldn't lower or barter because that's important. Every person needs to, here's the thing, in the church world, we are so scared about 
going on the deep end as it relates to um, sexuality. And it's an important part. It's, it's very important. You can keep acting like it's not. It's a very important part of humanity. And so we need to make sure that we are attractive, not just mentally, not just physically, but also mentally to people. Amen. Because if I can't have a conversation with you that is at your quote-unquote level or you can't have a conversation with me at my level, that's not attractive. And I said this on social media. I said, you know, we're so good at showing our body on social media. We need to start showing our brain. Yeah. Give me something to get behind a brand. All right, let's go through these. All right, recreational companionship that's going out, dating, consistent date nights, you know, alone time together, cuddle time, not only in bed, just, you know, on the couch or in a separate area without any children around. You really need that. That's where the affection comes in. And then do you want to speak? Uh, no. Sexual fulfillment. Oh, uh, Yeah. Yes, I know you want to speak um, on that one. Number 10, last one, <laughs> sexual fulfillment. Trying to help you. <laughs> Trying to help you. Um, I, I believe my personal theology on this is this, that relationships uh, between a couple can be as interesting as you want it to be because scripture says it's undefiled. And I think that if you are married, um, I'm trying to say it in a nice way. And when, and when we say undefiled between that husband and that wife, right. not bringing so, a third party, in, that husband and that wife. Right. Yeah, so... I mean, I didn't even think, you're so nasty, I didn't even think that. I'm just right. saying, because we know we do live in a world. <laughs> All right, praise God. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think we should hold conversation about your level of happiness. Your, and I think you also need other safe places that you can just, let me say it in a way that's not misinterpreted. You need other safe places that you can discuss fulfillment in marriage. And I'm not talking about outside of your context. I'm talking about maybe a marriage mentor, something of that nature, because a lot of times we're scared to say what we really feel because we don't want to put one down. And it's critically important that you have that open, honest conversation. And then now today, if you're single, like you don't know what half these individuals have You don't know if they are really interested in same-sex relationships or if they're into different relationships. So you got to be very cautious because here's the thing that I always tell people. If you give someone your heart, it's very hard to get it back when you want it back. So we're out of time, but let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time just to kind of go through some of these basic elementary needs that you hardwired into every human, every male, every female.